Hello, Twitch. We're back. It's AWS Howdy Partner. I'm Am Grabelny. I'm joined with Braden Caronte and Michael Palermo. Uh, I hope I said both of your last names. I don't know why I committed to saying your full names, <laughs> but I did. I did it, and I probably didn't get it right. And I apologize if I didn't. Uh, but I've got a difficult last name to say, so I'm just taking. I guess that's what I'm doing. I'm taking it out on all of you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's right. Doing. It's fine. <laughs> what is AWS Howdy Partner? You might ask, Brayden. What is AWS Howdy Partner? Yeah. So AWS Howdy Partner is where AM and I, or hosts such as AM and I, will bring on partners of AWS to show off all the cool things that they've built on AWS or that integrate with AWS. So today we are joined by Michael from here, who'll be showing us a cool demo using the here map and other features that uh, he's open to show off today. Yeah, what is here, Michael? You want to give us just a quick, maybe like two minute rundown of here? We're going to hear about it <laughs> all episode. This is yes. going to happen a lot. I, I have a it feeling. is going to happen. It's okay. It's a common word. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> here Technologies is a location services company. So, back in the day, way back in the day, they were known as a company called Navtech. It was the first company to actually introduce digital mapping to the internet, and uh, very tightly involved with the automobile industry. Uh, eventually, they were acquired, and I'm going. I'm skipping a lot of acquisitions, but uh, <laughs> one of the notable ones was when they were acquired by Nokia, and then Nokia, when it had its interesting um, sell of hardware and stuff like that to Microsoft, and around that time, also the location services uh, software side of the company uh, turned into here. So we've been around for a long time. Uh, major competitors, you know, just to put it out there to make it simple for people to understand would be Google Maps, TomTom, Tom, Mapbox. So those would be the, the kind of uh, those in our competing space. Cool, that's great. And and we're going to actually get a live demo from you too, as, as we build. Um, so, uh, Oh, somebody, somebody heard the chime noise as I as I turned the audio back on on the uh, streaming computer and it set them off. It was it was like a <laughs> what meeting am I in? Uh, oh, cool. <laughs> that, that's funny. That, that's a feeling that I can can empathize <laughs> with, not just sympathize with. Uh, yeah, sorry for <laughs> for the scare. Yeah, uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna see uh, here in action later. Um, but we're also going to be talking about a really cool technology uh, with Poly today, AWS Poly, right? Um, right. Brayden, you're going to give us that intro. Yeah. Uh, but do you want to tell us what Poly is first? Yeah, absolutely. And and that's that's a, a great lead into that. Is that Amazon Poly is a service that AWS offers that turns text into lifelike speech. And so you type in, hi, my name is Brayden, and through your computer speakers, you'll be able to hear a myriad of different voices that you can choose from say that sentence for you. So the reason we're choosing to to highlight Amazon Poly today is actually there's going to be later down the road an integration that Michael will show us or a feature of of one of his uh, dem in his demo of Poly. So we wanted to be able to highlight that and and let you know a little bit about more about po Amazon Poly before we just you know show it off to you because we want you to be able to appreciate and understand how it's working behind the scenes. So with that, let me yeah. let me tell you a cool a cool story there. Is that can I, can uh, I jump my, in real quick before you get started and just sure. point out this is live. Everybody watching, please feel free to interrupt just like I did just now and ask <laughs> Absolutely. questions. And uh, we will get those questions uh, answered to the best of our abilities. So please, please, please. I think in just a few moments too, Braden's going to ask you to to list out some of your fun ideas for how sure. you would use Bali. I've got one, just so you all know. I've got many, many uses for Poly, but one with maps specifically. Uh, I guess a hot new startup, but but I'll save that. So you have to watch Braden's demo, and then then you can hear about my hot new startup idea and invest early. Uh, <laughs> sure, thing, a lot thank of you, money. Ian. Thanks for for letting everyone know about that. So, a quick overview of of Amazon Poly. Like I said, it, it's a it's a text to speech 
uh, service that AWS offers that allows you to be able to uh, have multiple or have a neural uh, network be able to make that speech for you. So I'm going to demo a little bit of what that is first off, because this isn't like a conversation with, about containers to serverless where you need to be able to have a lot of history and context to build up to the, you know, the, the pain point problem and then the solution. We, we already know what it's like to have a computer read out to us uh, the, the speech or the text for us. So what's nice about Amazon Polly is or what it offers is lifelike conversation, right? And so with that, I'm going to share with you how that kind of works. And then you and all of us are going to be talking about some applications or some fun ideas where Amazon Polly would, would be kind of interesting to implement. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. AM, if you would like to help me there. Let's see here. Three, two, one. All right. And there we are. There Magic. we are. Okay. So I'll let you know that this is uh, available within your AWS console right now, right? And the reason I didn't want to build out a whole separate demo is because I wanted to highlight the different features uh, that AWS or Amazon Poly offers, right? And so here you have the the console, and we're going to go ahead and give it a, a quick whirl here. Hopefully that you can hear my audio. Let's let me know if you can. All right, Sam or, or Michael. Hi, my name is Joanna. I will read any text you type here. How, how did that she sound? She sounds great. All right, yeah. perfect. So you all heard that. That, that was Amazon Polly. I mean, now think about how, how natural and flowy that felt to hear that, right? Now, there are a couple of features that you can change within, well, more than a couple, actually, that you can change within Amazon Polly, right? So you can see here, Within the engine, you got standard, which, as you can see here, is it, it flows really well. Now, with neural, it's going to be a lot more uh, human-like. And so we're going to go ahead and change that to neural. And let's listen for the difference real quick here. Hi, my name is Joanna. I will read any text you type here. All right, so that, you know, the, the inevitable inflection points that happen in conversation are are dealt with here with a different engine behind Amazon Polly, right? And so, whereas you would have a, a standard probably for more of a, uh, if you ever have called into a, a customer service line, that the, you probably have heard more of the standard voice. Now, if you wanted to have it a more natural feel to it, then you would put the the neural engine behind it there. Now. The nice thing about Amazon Polly is that it offers a wide array array of voices. So within English, you can you can see here, you could choose from uh, five female voices or four male voices. Hello, my name is Kevin. I will read any text you type here. All right. I haven't heard Kevin. Kevin's new for me. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. I believe, uh, before the show, uh, Am was saying that Justin was his favorite. Hi. My name is Justin. <laughs> I will read any text you type here. Oh, it's yeah. still a nightmare. It's still a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And then, uh, you know, with Amazon Polly, you also get a few other options. Now, not all of them are available in neural. As you can see here, you got Portuguese, Brazilian. Uh, we can know uh, we can do this. Olá, well. meu nome é Camila. Eu posso ler qualquer texto que você digitar aqui. Right. And so they're starting to expand a little bit on that. But as far as the standard engine goes, they have a plethora of options here. So yeah, Russian right here. Привет. Меня зовут Татьяна. Я прочитаю любой текст, который вы введете здесь. Yes. And so and, and the cool thing is, is that you can even have the voice be bilingual. So if I were and I don't know if this is possible within the console, but let's see what happens if we say hi. And my name is Brayden. But it has it selected as Danish. So you notice here that it actually read this text here in Danish. Now, right now, this doesn't have the ability to, uh, as you know, the demo as itself, it doesn't have the ability, but you can make it bilingual where you could have this read in a Danish accent. So that that's something that's pretty cool. Now, again, there wasn't a lot of, there's not too much setup to talk or to understand the benefits of having text to speech. The actual fun part of the conversation here is how can this apply to any of your current projects or any use cases that you can think of that would be fun or funny 
that uh, you'd be willing to share in the chats. So for those that are on right now, like, let's hear any cool project ideas. And sorry, I'm trying to, I'm going to take uh, take you uh, off my demo chat. real quick, AM. Okay, let me I'm move back. I'm going to try your guys' chats here. But the, the big question is, is what fun applications have you done before using Amazon Poly or something that you could do in the future? All right, I'll, I'll keep an eye on chat. Do you want me to yeah, tell you right. uh, a little bit? So of, for, uh, for me, I know that, uh, you know, I there's, there's a few funny ones, right? So I, I have a couple of kids and sometimes they like to, to climb on things that they shouldn't. And so I know for me, I wanted to build an application where I can just push a button and I can tell my kids not to climb onto the specific table or couch. Instead of me having to uh, repeat myself a million times, I would love to be able to just push a button each time. And then that Amazon Polly will make that announcement for me on my Alexa or something like that. That, my, that right there would be probably one of the most beneficial buttons in my life if I get that ever created. Cool. Very cool. Michael, did, uh, did you have it? It sounds like you had a cool use case. Did you, were you thinking on one? You know what? I'll tell you what, it's kind of like what we're going to see in the demo a little later. Uh, sometimes we think, oh, we have to have a big idea. But I think what's kind of cool about Polly is the subtlety. And that is there's probably so many use cases where there's a subtle use for it. So it doesn't have to be the main attraction, but just by adding that feature, it enriches that user experience so much more so. And and and, and of course, what's fun is that later on, as we see when we build a map, we'll be able to see how we don't think maps as being verbal. So now now we can, you know, and, and just what we'll be showing a little later, I have a feeling that a lot of people are going to have better ideas than what I'm going to be demoing. So it'll be, and in fact, I'm really curious to hear what AM is. Event. I don't know if he's saving that for later or if he if he's going to reveal his IP over Twitch. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, I'd love to hear what he has as a creative idea, especially since maps are involved. Yeah, the map is, is kind of at the heart of this. Uh, hmm. It's it's a really really expensive idea. I went the opposite direction, like you said. You know, maybe these simple interaction. Nope, this is really really complicated and is going to need a lot of uh, a lot of expensive uh, licensing and and intellectual property. Uh, what do you think? Should I should I should I reveal? Yeah, please. Okay. All right. Okay. Y you two can get it on the ground floor. Just so, just <laughs> just saying. Uh, very low cost of entry. You know. Only a couple hundred thousand dollars. I'm sure you can, you know, we'll, we'll talk money off. It's too, yeah, I, I shouldn't have even dropped a number here. Uh, we'll talk, <laughs> talk after the stream. Uh, here's my idea. Take here maps, take Polly. We're going to need to get a contract going with uh, probably Fox, uh, which I guess technically is now Disney, David Duchovny, and Gillian Anderson. Because I've just been watching for the first time, and this is really off-brand for me, uh, <laughs> that I haven't watched it before. The X Files. I've never mm -hmm. seen it. I'm watching it for the first time. I just started mm -hmm. season one. Just finished. Wow. Uh, what I want to do is get it, a map, an interactive map of everywhere from every episode that they go Ooh. and investigate, and then get descriptions of what they investigated, like case files, you know, they always do the field journal, right? Like, uh, and just, it'll be David Duchovny and Jillian Anderson's voice in Pauly, wow. right? Wow. Uh, I told you, I'm, I'm going big with this. There you go, right there. Right. You know, you, you click on Roswell or something, and it's like Roswell was a smoke screen, but it, it's in David Duchovny's voice, not mine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> There you go. You can get it on the ground floor. That's awesome. And, wow. and the best part, from a developer perspective, a lot of the heavy lifting's done, right? Like getting the text to speech done. That's that's with Polly. Getting the maps and having the the coordinates, uh, and getting those tied to like some sort of metadata system or whatever. It's mm -hmm. easy. Just here, right? Like it's, it's not that expensive to build. It's just the IP. There you but, go million dollar idea you heard it right here let's go cool. with here <laughs> michael i'm sure you're tired of this pun sorry there, there's going to be at least 10 more before the end of the show 
it, it, I'm so used to it. And you know what's so funny is if uh, when uh, traveling to conferences and stuff, you know how it is when someone thinks that they have something original, you know, yeah. some kind of pun with the word here. Yeah, it's like I've never heard it before. Uh, but yes, a lot of people <laughs> uh, definitely feel that they have to get it out of their system and come up with some kind of funny pun with the word here. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, chat that's basically an invitation that uh you know if there's another here pun mike would love to hear it just so you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right so so with that for those that have joined uh welcome to howdy partner this is where aws will bring on a partner to be able to demo a cool thing that they've been able to build that uh, on aws or integrates with aws uh, so with that we have here michael from here to be able to show with us the cool thing that's he and his company have been able to build room boy tv as as an interesting idea here uh oh this person says that they are making a google earth project to list all the battles they play in a, a game called war of rights not familiar with it, but that's okay. But there are a lot of games that have like battle locations or locations in game, things like that. Uh, that would be a cool use case to to like track all of the things that I did in this game and then populate yeah. the map. You know that that's gonna that'd be cool. And it'd be interesting to see uh, what uh, Roomboy TV would would want to use or or if they even have intentions to use. Um, poly for so i didn't see that in the in the comment any any use for voice but uh would be interesting to find out if they can uh put that in the chat that would be interesting because you know the voice thing is i think kind of the star of the show I, obviously maps are fun part two but i i really love getting that interactive voice uh involved with uh things that you don't think of that are typically talking things yeah um, and make sure it's cheaper than getting David Duchovny and Gillian Anderson. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a good thing to suggest. Go, I go agree. cheap. <laughs> uh, well, cool. So, Michael, you want to you want to take over and uh, start talking us through the types of things that that here can do. And and I know you've got a map for us today that you've added some cool functionality. I, I think you're going to build. From what you've told me, you're going to build some of this live in front of us. Yeah, in fact, uh, for the most part, it's going to be built from scratch. There's a few things that have been pre-done just because I, I'm i not a fan of typing exercises. Uh, but uh, for the most part, it's going to be uh, building an interactive web page with a map with some voice interactive features in it. All right. Uh, so right off the bat, uh, you know, I so are you uh, sharing my screen as of yet? I've got it up just now. Okay, just now. So uh, this is how simple that HTML file looks at the beginning of all of this. It's just a, I mean, there's nothing in it. It's literally just pretty much the metadata of an HTML file. You know, Howdy Partner Demo is all I have in there. What I would like to do is I want to build uh, this HTML file out kind of gradually, show how it's going to look uh, after we do some updates here and there, and uh, eventually, like I said, uh, evolve it into something that can provide a little fun uh, talking. And uh, w when I built this, so of course I have the finished product, but when I built it, uh, one of the things that I got stuck doing just, you know, like wasting time is finding areas and i found a lot in in washington uh where i wouldn't know how to pronounce these names of these different places so just you know and then i want to hear different voices say them so i thought that was kind of fun so that kind of gives you a clue of what we're going to be building here uh shortly so let me start off by saying uh the first part of this demo is going to be introducing things that are related to here maps now what I'd like to do is go ahead. I'm going to uh, switch over my screen so that you could see our developer portal. And in fact, if you could put the the uh, link into the chat for uh, our developer portal, this is where developers can go and sign up for their own free account. Uh, you get up to 250,000 transactions a month for free. Uh, it, it's a it's a phenomenal system. No credit card required for you to just start playing around, prototyping, doing what you want. 
uh, and, and getting started with our with our either our APIs or SDKs. Uh, in this case, I'm going to just highlight here that I'm going to be using from our maps perspective, I'm mostly going to be using our JavaScript APIs. So I'm going to click on on that now so you can kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about by JavaScript APIs. And I'm, I'm going to go right to the documentation. And, and specifically, once I get to the documentation, I want to go to the examples. And because uh, to me, this is where a lot of developers just like to get started, you know, like if you wanted to see a map at a specific location, which is which is on that on that side, then here's all the code that you need in order to you know make that work. So it's copy paste done, right? The Braden the Bradenburg Gate, right? Braden right there. Y yeah, check that. out. Oh, whoops, I zoomed too quickly. Hold on. That's, That's right. It's close. Spell Brandenburg. Bradenburg. Yeah, yeah, it's close. Yeah. I'll let our docs people know that we have a, a spelling error, but yeah. Thank you, Brad. I appreciate I'll, that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the reason why I'm also highlighting this area is because not only is it easy to find examples, but once you do find those examples, uh, you can even fork them on GitHub or edit them in JS Fiddle right away. So if for those that want to do it like, oh, I like this example, let me go right to JS Fiddle and, and do some playing around, you know, great. It's it's very easy to use. Uh, in, in my case, what I want to do is just also highlight that in the H, so we're looking at the JavaScript for this page. In the HTML, you'll also notice that there are a series of uh scripts that need to be added to the page so what i'm going to do right now is go back over to my code editor and i'm just going to go ahead and copy and paste uh, the necessary links for this page to work so that's going to go right here like such and i'll just pretty that up here so these are our files that I would say are the typical starting files for most of your JavaScript inside of a web page, and also a CSS file for some of the common uh, styling things that go with a map. If you don't put that CSS file in there, it'll still work, but you might not have as fluid of a of an experience. So it's good to have all of those in there if possible. You'll notice things like a UI, map events, core, and service. So all, all, core is like the core map. Service is going to be anything that's related to some of our, our API services. One I will be demoing uh, at some point called reverse geocoding. And then uh, UI and map events are exactly what you think. Uh, some UI capabilities and some, and being able to respond to some of the map events. So at that, at that, uh, so far, any questions? I haven't really done anything yet, but uh, you following me along so far? Yeah, just pull in that's from uh, yeah. your CDN, right? Like that, that's all I got to do. Yeah. So that's all that is at that point. Then, in order to get a map, um, all you need to do is you identify a div. Usually you give it an ID. I like to give my maps the ID of a map container. Uh, I know some disagree with why I use this instead of just the word map, but I like to use map container because I use I like to use a global variable in JavaScript called map to represent the actual map object. And and the div here can just be the container of that visual map. So you know, I'm just having to explain myself, but I'll leave it at that. So I have my div there, and I also am going to include a script onto this page. So this script is going to be uh, a module type. And uh, you don't have to do it this way. Uh, in fact, if, uh, I'll show you in just a moment in the documentation that the, the actuality is, is you don't, there's no need for you to have to uh, do anything other than just put the JavaScript right onto the page itself. But I've just been forcing myself into this habit lately of uh, separating out all my JavaScript outside of the HTML elements. So that's just my personal, you know, feeling. I, I don't even want to see an on click, you know, button, you know, I don't want to see anything like that in the HTML. It's just going to be pure. And this right? is so like nice assuming, and clean. I was I was going to say this is assuming too that you're not using like a front end framework like React or Angular or something like that too, which 
I Googles and you all have a tutorial about React at least. So you do. Yeah, so if, for those who are interested in creating components or, or you integrating with some of those very popular front end uh, frameworks, we, we usually have blog posts and tutorials and we're always updating these because as you know, those things are always updating too. So, uh, you know, just, just so that uh, you can integrate, uh, another popular thing is to integrate with Leaflet. We can easily do that with our MapTile API. But yeah, you're right. This example, and I'm glad you called it out, this example actually uses no front end whatsoever. It, it is a pure static HTML page. That's it. Although, again, I'm just going to be separating my concerns out into another thing called app.js. And now that I've done that, I want to go into that file. So I've already created that file, even though it's empty. Um, and I just want to let you see what I would likely put in here in order to make the map work. We've already identified through this div tag called map container that it's going to go on the page. Now we need to learn how to fill that div with the map stuff. So what, I, what I'm going to do is, first of all, bring over into the uh, right here. Let me just bring this uh, into here. I'm just going to copy and paste some of this stuff so I can just talk about it a little bit so I don't have to type all of this. So you'll notice that I have a container that is pointing to that map container on the page. So basically all I'm saying is give me that element on the page that's called map container and let's call it container. Then I grab this thing called an API key. Now. I want you to see, you, you notice the last three uh, characters are like VN4. Yeah. Uh, do you see that on the screen? Yes. yes. So I want you to see that when you are logged in to, uh, which I'll, I'll go ahead and make sure that I'm logged in right now. Uh, so I'm logging in as if with my developer account to my evangelism demos project name. And uh, if you create your free account, you're going to have something called a freemium plan. That's the one with that 250,000 transactions per month. So, you know, uh, it's free. Again, not even a credit card asked for when you log in. It's pretty simple. It takes less than two minutes. But if I were to uh, view this API key here, you'll see it ends, even though it's really small print, it ends with VN4. So I'm using something right from my developer uh, portal. I I logged in, and when you log in at the, you'll see your your initials at the top, and then you can go to your projects. I'm just showing you one more time, just in case someone's like, "How did he get there?" So I went from my profile to my projects, projects to. Uh, you'll probably have something called freemium if you're brand new. If you didn't change it by default, it's called freemium something. But when I clicked on there, then of course you could see your API keys. So I've created only one of two keys because we do these public demos a lot. Sometimes we switch them out, drop one, create another one, you know, just in case someone thinks that there's some reason they have to steal my free stuff <laughs> instead <laughs> of having their own free stuff. But uh, at least you know where to grab the API key. Uh, any comments on that? I that makes sense okay. to us. Looks like chat hasn't okay. said anything quite yet. Okay. So uh, now I just want to continue this. So when I create my platform object, which is uh, used to help initialize things uh, for our maps, I'm loading that in with that API key that's been listed up here. Of course, I could have just posted this in here and not created this API key thing, but I like to make it specific so you could see it for the demo. Now I want to add a few more things that will uh, help with this. And by the way, all of these things are typically found in our examples. So almost looking exactly just like this, like, you know, like every, if you just go to the JavaScript or to the HTML of all our examples, this is what we call our boilerplate type initialization. So it's pretty, pretty much uh, the same across the board. There might be some small variances, but uh, Can I ask Michael but, that, that that H object is that just uh, what gets initialized by uh, pulling in those those scripts from uh, from the here uh, that are mentioned in the index HTML. Yeah. You are just, correct, sir. Yes. All right. That H, that H is coming from the core. 
okay. that we've been looking at before. So yeah, it's a global object, kind of similar to uh, one that we'll talk about later when you uh, set a reference to the AWS SDK, there's some global objects there too that are just available. So H happens to be ours probably for here. Um, I never asked for sure, but I'm sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just making a guess. Um, uh, so, of course, uh, maps maps can have layers. And when we're talking about layers, uh, you know, another way that I think I heard AM say it when he was trying to talk about his scenario was metadata, you know, like this somehow this metadata thing. So we're just going to have some default layers uh, created uh, at the beginning. Another thing, AM, that you mentioned that is something else we offer as a service that kind of extends or goes beyond just layers is this idea of having your own space uh, uh, where you can store, and we could store it on your behalf. So you create a space in like a cloud that we have, and you can store a lot of metadata objects in there too. So oh, cool. call that like Data Hub. Uh, our studio is a way to visually show those things as well. But like I when you were talking about your X Files example, I was thinking, yeah, that metadata space could be all those locations, right? And so, you, and then you could put customized metadata for every one of those locations, images, a whole bunch of stuff. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I I'm going to be short a couple hundred thousand for the. Uh, the, you know <laughs> what you're asking, but I think it's a great idea. Hopefully, someone steps up. <laughs> Uh, sad. That's sad to me that that you don't you just <laughs> lack the vision. Of, I know. <laughs> I don't have skin in the game. I'm weak. Small uh, amount of money. Uh, anyway, uh, this is gonna get probably too in the weeds, and and so just uh, ignore this question if it it is too complicated. Uh, but the, please, at, you know, once we get to that data store, I'm really interested in this. Does it do any like local syncing between like? If you're running this on a device like iOS or whatever, if you're running this on, uh, you know, browser like we are, uh, will it sync between local storage and 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 cloud and, or or anything like that, or is it just so? A, that's a, a that trip? is a great question. I think that the answer to that is is you're in control, so you can oh, you nice. can you can control that behavior and and even choose your own local storage strategy if you wanted to. But for the most part, what we provide off out you know out of the box so to speak is the ability for you to create that space in the cloud that's unique to you that contains metadata unique to you um and then how you might want to sync that with your local stuff is is up to you but you can awesome good to know um so of course none of this is really exciting so i'm just i just wanted to make sure that you understand that what what we're doing is we're setting the stage for this initial map uh, so a layers object is needed because that's going to be required down below when I actually finally create the map object. The initial point, uh, which which I'm putting here on line 13, is a geo point that is pointing to you know these geo geolocation coordinates. So you know latitude, longitude, and uh, I'll just tell you right now it's in Seattle. You know that's gonna, where this I, is. That was going to be my question. I was like, Michael, do you know this? <laughs> I do. I do. It's going to be Seattle. Um, and I think that's also interesting to note that, you know, the language of maps is geolocation. You know, that that's how maps think in terms of when we say where something is, a digital map thinks in terms of geo coordinates. And, and I think that's important because we as people do not think that way. We think in terms of Seattle, Washington, USA. And then we can even drill it down into a particular address, a zip code, you know, and all sorts of things. So one of the services that we offer is our geocoding service. And geocoding is all about resolving those two th things. If someone only knows the, like Phoenix, Arizona, where I live, that's all they know, then we can figure out what the geolocation coordinate is for Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, or vice versa. Here's the geolocation coordinate, what's there? And that's actually what we're going to be doing in our demo, we're going to be saying, if I give you this, tell me what's there. So that that's going to be kind of fun to do. So right now, yes, Braden, you're correct. That is Seattle, where that location is. And by the way, that and the reason why I chose Seattle uh, is is because one of our main offices is also based out of Seattle. So that's that's where the my boss, the VP over Devrel, that's his domain. So. Uh, Thought I would give our office up there some respect. 
uh, <laughs> when I create the map, I, I, in, I indicate, hey, this is the container. So that's that div on the page. I want it to be a, a normal vector map. And you know, there's other variations here, but I'm going to show you how I'm going to do some styling in a little bit. Uh, set the set the center of the map to be this these coordinates. Set the zoom level. This is something between one and fifteen, where one is global and fifteen is street level. So I'm I'm trying to get down you know into the nitty gritty a little bit. And then this final thing is just basically saying let's choose the pixel ratio of the window, and if it doesn't provide one, then use one. So that's it for that. Um, I'm going to save that. And what I'd like to do now is just uh, indicate that now that now that I've made those changes, what I've done is I've saved it. I'm going to go back over to our map or or to our browser, I should say. And I, I'm going to click on this screen, which is usual if this was a blank screen. Uh, and we're going to see if anything has changed if I reload this page at all. So what I'm seeing now is a screen with a map on it and that's sound, that's yeah. the coordinates you know it's sound right there now i want you to know uh, this is kind of hard to do or prove but I, i'll try to be dramatic with my mouse okay i'm going to try to be dramatic um <laughs> can you hear me clicking on my mouse yes. uh maybe you can't i'm yeah. trying to drag i'm trying to drag the screen around right now it's not letting me I can't. Locked, this is man. a this is a static map at this point. Okay. Just a static map. Um, I wanted to showcase that because I want you to understand what I'm going to be adding next, and that's what I call behaviors. Uh, these behaviors allow, and just just literally by adding these two lines here, uh, one is going to be let's let's create something called a behavior. Let's associate it with our map, and let's also uh, create a UI object. And just literally the existence of these objects are going to be enablers to uh, how this is now going to work. So with that change, I'm going to go back over in uh, to uh, the screen that I had here. Sorry, just a moment. I'm also, by the way, behind the screen, if, if I sometimes hesitate just a little bit and I got to get my timing correct, as I'm also uh, uh, pushing this from my private repository to the actual website. So it's not running local on my machine. It's actually, uh, you know, pushing those changes up. So let me do a refresh now. Okay. And now uh, you Ooh. can see, hopefully, that uh, I have. You were getting over to Bainbridge there now. Yeah. yeah. So Michael, <laughs> question here is that because of the existence of those two things, does that unlock the rest of the world, essentially? Oh, oh so yes, so, yes. Yeah, so wow. I'm with my mouse wheel. I'm now going to zoom out. And and I know what you mean by that because if I had left that map on the screen and I did not have those two other objects, I would have been stuck on that one screen. Couldn't move. Couldn't do anything else. But yeah, we can go to the entire world uh, at this point and. Yeah, it works great. Wow. So another thing that happened because we enabled the UI object. So um, if I recall correctly, you guys are somewhere in the Austin area. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, let me see if I can remember where Austin is. Is it? Am I getting close? Do like we have any uh, Texans in the chat that want to help out Michael here? Yeah. Getting close. Yeah. Where, 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 where? Let's see. I think we were looking at Dallas just a second ago. It's not San Antonio. That's too, too far south. Too far south. This is Dallas. Too far north. Yeah, you're you're bouncing around. It's in it's in between Dallas and San Antonio. Really? It's a small place, huh? There's Waco. I cannot believe I cannot just see it. Find the city. <laughs> I'm surprised I cannot see it. Now, right, you yeah. guys are from there. You should be able to know how to get me to. Uh... <laughs> so it's. Yeah. Uh, Go down 35 from yeah, Dallas. southwest of Dallas. That that highway that you see going through Waco. Keep going down a bit. And there it is. Uh, I'm seeing it now. OK, so 
I'm I'm drilling into Austin, like right here. Is this? Would you consider this like a downtown area? Yeah, that's like I, right I consider where, that. Yeah, where the university kind of is. There's yeah. university. So as I get closer, uh, here's a, here's a couple interesting things. I'm going to hold the Alt key on my keyboard, and and by panning around, because oh. I'm holding the Alt on my keyboard, I can also get in a little bit of dimension. Uh, and I could start to see building structures. Uh, and again, that's just because I enabled those two objects, right? Yeah. But then I can go also into this map layer here and say, I want to see traffic incidents. So now yeah. I can go to these particular traffic incidents, just click on them. And, you know, it, maybe this is important to you guys. I don't know. You're, you're in Austin. <laughs> Maybe you need to know that there's been a closure between Martin Luther King Boulevard and Clyde Littlefield Drive. I don't know. Okay, and yeah, that's but, all like UT. Uh, essentially, just 35 should just be closed. Like I almost. know, right? Yeah, and it basically <laughs> is, right? <laughs> just a little, a little Austin humor for you. Everybody can relate. Yeah. Uh, I can also show traffic conditions. So just clicking that means that where you see the red lines on the screen now, you can now see, of course, there's some traffic here on 35. It's bad. That is a parking lot. And I can also <laughs> switch over to satellite view if I also wanted to see it from that perspective. So uh, those are some of the things that we have just provided by default. You didn't have to do any special coding that makes the map interactive uh, wow. with the user and the UI. Uh, so I'm going to, any questions or comments or? So it sounds like, you know, this is the default that's given to us out of the box. It sounds like there is a way you can configure it to, to your liking uh, with a, couple, a few more lines of code. Is that what I'm understanding, Michael? What a great segue. Great. So <laughs> I will go ahead and and add these lines here. So we added these two lines here, but now, now I'm going to this style. And what I'm doing is I'm saying, I would like to open up and create a new style and, and initialize things to be at a 45 degree tilt. So before I had to click the, uh, you know, the Alt button on my keyboard and then you know, move things around, but now I can start it at a particular three dimensional uh, degree. And uh, notice that, on line 24 and 25, what, what, what it's doing is it's loading a local YAML file. Uh, you guys yes, should yes. have heard of YAML before, have you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cloud formation. Yeah. Uh, what do you guys typically use it for? Configuration, like cloud formation, Kubernetes mm -hmm. manifests, uh, all, all those good things. Right. So in this example, this this YAML is is providing all the configuration information for the kind of colors and the things that we'd like to see on the map, which uh, is completely customizable by you. So wow. uh, you know, really easy to to set up. I'm I'm not going to go through and discuss this in detail. I'm just letting you know that you can modify it there. I think we're we're eventually going to have an online tool that makes it really super easy for people to create their own custom YAML. Uh, but I right see now. Actual function code in there too, like JavaScript. Yeah, I, I, I was gonna say there's like a function code in there. Yeah, if you go back there. to the YAML file real quick. Yeah, language text source. Like that'll actually run that function. That's crazy. That is crazy. That's cool. <laughs> I love that. You know what's funny is I've never even thought to look at that. And and now that you mention it, it's like that is interesting that's in there. I don't know how I feel about it, but Yes, yeah, it's in there. <laughs> pretty wild. Uh, that's that takes infrastructure as code to a whole new level, right? <laughs> um, I'm going to reload this page, and and I just want you to see that now it's at that 45 degree, you know, tilt. It is, and it is using a custom styling. So we're getting a little closer. Uh, to some of the fun interactive things. Now I'll kind of have the, the table set for that. So I'm going to go back over into our code. And I want to get into, by the way, this last line here is yeah. really good for, for uh, if you resize your map uh, without that. Now I already have that in there, but without it, if you resize your map, it, it can, it may get confused 
like for, and I'll give you a great example of this. Uh, F12 is usually the debugger, you know, window on a browser, which will pop out. And, and if you do that and, and then make it go away, if you don't have this one line in there, the map might not resize the way you think it should. You know, so it's it's one of those things where it's just good to have. It's in almost every one of our code examples already baked in there that, you know, and, unless you want to customize it to do something differently, you should may probably resize your map uh, viewport also when the window resizes. So that's that's all that it's there for. Two things, Michael, real quick. So yeah. uh, we're about 45 minutes in. Uh, if you're just joining us, you are watching AWS's Howdy Partner. Uh, I'm A.M. Grabelny. We got Braden here. We got Michael from Here Technologies as well. We're talking about Here, which uh, I mean, we're not even at 30 lines of code yet, and you've already got a fully functioning map with uh, very little uh, coding necessary to to get all of the features and functionality of what I would expect an online map to have at bare minimum, if if not like some features that I wouldn't even expect, like traffic and things like that. That's pretty mm -hmm. amazing. Uh, Michael is giving yeah. us a hands-on demo of how to add here maps to your technology, uh, whatever application you're building. We're working in a front-end environment here with uh, just vanilla JavaScript, but I saw things for Android and iOS as well over on the here page. Uh, if you have questions, please, please put them in the Twitch chat. We are actively monitoring it. We want to know what you want to build with this. We want to know uh, what you want to see us do with this. Uh, whatever, right? Just hit us up in chat. Uh, Braden and I are watching. I wanted to ask Michael. I see this uh, map events object off of your uh, here object here. Um, is this like a is this a state management kind of thing? Is this like is this where if I wanted to listen for events, I, I see you're adding the event listener for resize, which kind of like a general window event. But like, mm -hmm. does that map events actually have uh, things that happen inside the map that I can hook yes. into and, and add a, yes. like a Lambda function in there? Yeah, well, Lambda is or, uh, interesting. Uh, you, you could, function, sorry. Uh, yeah, you, could you could call. Uh, you know, if you have it set up to, of course, do a serverless call or any kind of API call. Uh, but yeah, the, those uh, those behaviors are, there's so many of them, right? I mean, there's just so many things that uh, if you click on the map itself, if you, if something has changed within the map and you need to have some information, we're going to actually see a few of these in just a second. We're going to, we're going we're gonna to see some of those uh uh, come into play where the behavior is a required object to have it enlisted. Without behavior, you basically have a static map. And by the way, if, uh, I should just indicate that could be very desirable. Yeah. Uh, it could be that someone just literally, like if you're if you have an about us and and you just want to show a static map on a page, there's really no need to introduce a whole bunch of complexity if it's just a static map. So, you know, it, it doesn't have to be something that can change. Uh, or be interactive. It can just be static. But this line 18 makes sure that it is interactive. That's the key. And the UI thing that you see here, that was the thing. If you didn't want the traffic incidents, if you didn't want to have the satellite view toggle and stuff, you just don't use a UI object. And then that turns off. So, yeah, cool. you know, so, but uh, like you said, with just a few lines of code, we already have a pretty nice interactive map. Now, now what I want to do, first of all, I, I also want to, uh, go back to our, our HTML page. Uh, I do want to add a style tag because I, I think it's important to note. Now, of course, I could do this in an external CSS, but uh, because there's so little, I'm just I'm just going to indicate a couple things that I think are good practices, especially if you're going to do a full screen map. So the first thing that I would recommend is that you uh, style the body. And this again, whoops, uh, wrong ones. If you want the body uh, to be completely uh, like free of any white space around the map, sometimes the browsers will show this little, you know, you, you want like a clean all the way to the edge kind of a look. Then you want to make sure that the padding and the margin is set to zero. So I'm just doing that as a as a little tip trick. The other thing that I like to do for full screen maps, even though it's currently working, uh, we just haven't challenged it to do anything else. I'm going to change that the map container 
is also got its own style. And what I want to make sure there is that the width of this is 100 VW. So 100% of our view and same with the height. I also want to make sure that that is 100% view height. Oops, and of course, yeah, I, yeah, that's fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see, did that fix? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and just for completeness. OK, good. So I say that I'm going to go back over. So I just want to, you know, that's just like a little tip trick. It doesn't take long to just enter those things in there. Uh, make sure you have a nice, clean map look and feel. Uh, now, now that we have added uh, some of the core things, the, the next thing that I wanted to uh, indicate that you can do is going to be uh, adding a marker. So one of the things that's going to make this demo interesting is that we're going to create a marker. We're going to put the marker on the screen and allow us to, to uh, do some interaction with that marker to get some information about things. Uh, I could have made it so that you just click on a map, but I thought a marker is visual. Uh, we can have some fun with it. So uh, let's see what that looks like to to have a marker on the screen. So literally, I'm just going to add this code right here, which is uh, I ca I'm calling it drag marker. Uh, the reason why, uh, despite any other connotation, it means it's going to be a drag and droppable marker. <laughs> that's that's what that means. Uh, you could see that I'm initializing that it is going to be shown at the init point, which up here was that area. And it's the same area that's the center of the map by default. So we want to put this marker in the center of the map is what we're saying. So initialize it there, add that uh, object uh, to our map. So what I'm going to do now is go ahead and uh, commit this. And we're going to go take a look at what the default marker looks like in the center of the screen. So I'll get back over to our demo. And I'm going to refresh the screen. And there we have a marker in the center of the screen. Now, just because I called it a draggable marker or a drag marker doesn't make it a marker that I can drag around. I won't bore you with me trying to be emphatic and dramatic about trying to drag it because it I can tell you it's not going to work. <laughs> I have to do some things that are going to make it uh, work. Uh, so the first thing that I want to do is I want to indicate that it's it's a draggable thing. So that's that's point number one is right on the next line. I'm going to say, hey, drag marker uh, draggable is going to equal true. And the other thing that I want to do uh, to make this a little bit more, uh, well, no, I'll, I'll just leave it there. So I'll just show you just how simple it is just to do that. So I'll make sure that that is pushed up, go back over to our page. And so now if I refresh this again, uh, if, if I were to take this, oh, you know, it's still not letting me, you know, I, I can't, I can't drag this thing around. There's a reason why it's doing that. Uh, I do have to add a couple other things. One of the things that I need to do is indicate when I'm I'm creating it in its constructor, I have to add something in here that says, uh, um, and this is inside of these uh, curly braces because it's a JSON object, uh, volatility. And then uh, I want to set that volatility to uh, it just equal true. I feel but like you're describing itself. me. Are you sure? <laughs> Wait, are you talking about me? Like I'm right here. My yeah, God. yeah, uh, no. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> all right. but even that is not it. Because if you think about it, just making it drag and droppable, all we're doing at this point is we're saying we have given this marker the permission to be drag and droppable. But in order for that behavior to take place, we have to, as the developers say, so what do we do and, and you know of course we have control over every single stage the moment they attempt to drag it as it's being dragged and when they let go you know those are all points so because of that and this is where this is one of those examples of i don't want to do a typing exercise i 
am just going to drag over onto the screen uh, these dragging events. So you could see starting on line 38, this is what happens when it starts. And all we're saying is, hey, if the thing that we're dragging happens to be an instance of a map marker, then we're going to go ahead and visually allow it to be the same as wherever the pointer is, you know, like wherever the cursor would be. So that that's really what it's setting the stage for. I'm just translating that into human speak. Um, it's doing the same thing. All the drag is doing is the same thing is, and we're continuing to let it follow wherever the pointer is or wherever the cursor is. Then hmm. finally, when you look at this last one, which is on line 54, now we're saying if it happens to be, uh, the, you know, the last thing, then let's go ahead and set the center uh, of, of, or put this marker the target, which is of type of uh, uh, map marker, let's put it into the center of the map. So wherever, so think of it this way, if you dragged the marker way to the edge of the screen and then left it there and I didn't have that line, it would mean it's just way out, way out there. But what I wanna do is have it come all the way full center. So it's just like an automatic service for you. Just put it right yeah. back in the center of the screen. Um, there is one line that is missing in here. And that is, you'll notice on line 44, I have a disable. You know, this disable means it is going to disable other behaviors while this drag and drop is in progress. That's really what that means. So you can't really do anything else until this function is complete. So what can you guess needs to go back in here? Enable. Exactly. So I'll actually put that, uh, yeah, I'll just put it right here. Uh, behavior uh, dot enable. So this might be a little off topic. And, you know, as AM said, if, if you're going to hit this later, let me know. But, you know, if you're disabling the other behaviors, that kind of begs the question is, what are the other behaviors that could happen to that marker other than being dragged? No, it's not. It's actually even broader than that. It's not the behavior of the marker. It's the behavior of the map. Oh, the whole map. Got it. Yeah. It's like saying right now, uh, the behavior of the map is kind of like in this like frozen zone while we're trying to figure out where this marker is going to go. Once it drops, then we can return those behaviors on again. Otherwise, uh, I don't know. I, I guess I haven't tested to see what kind of chaos could incur, <laughs> but uh <laughs> But, but what is interesting is that all of the code that you see here is in our sample code. You know, that example I showed you before, if you look for drag and drop marker, it's literally almost exactly word for word what's in that example. So I've done nothing special so far. I will be, but but so far, this is almost straight out of our example uh, code. This shows you... So, uh how little I keep up with the HTML spec too. Uh, I had no idea that these were all supported events now in in several browsers. I went and looked it up on Mozilla. Mozilla is the, the page I always go to for like JavaScript and HTML stuff. Mozilla's got such great docs for front end devs. Uh, but yeah, so like drag start, drag, drag in, these are all just supported like events on the window object in the browser. Um, so these aren't even events that you all are adding with the uh, with the peer SDK, is it? So I mean, let's just say they are tied to the map, right? So they're uh, for drag for the drag start, drag and drag, and for our maps, we are actually in control of that behavior. Okay. So and so we, these are events we, that we've designated. We've got a question from uh, Poyos uh, Hernandez. Uh, I almost I thought it was Poyos Hermanos, but Poyos <laughs> Hernandez asks, where is the behavior object in drag start event defined? So kind of similar question. Um, right here on line 18. Yeah. So this was from a little earlier in the demo when we were starting to create, you know, all the core objects. And so that behavior object was created right when we were creating all the other initializing data. Cool. Good question. So uh, the idea here is, Let's see if what we did actually works. 
So I have all of this in here. Again, the only thing that we've really added as a behavior was that it can now be drag and droppable. So I'm going to go over back to our screen. Uh, make sure I do a nice little refresh of the screen. And if I attempt to grab it, aha, wow. I have a mark that's moving around. I can see what I mean. If I go place it way over here, I want it to just automatically center. That's that's what I meant by that one line. Just center me, please. You know, so we can we can move around, you know, like ah, easily. Yeah. Otherwise, I would have to manually move to that spot. So I, you know, just assume that this marker is always center, you know, center stage, so to speak. And are those coordinates being saved somewhere? I, I think you mentioned something about local storage. Is that where it's being saved for future reference? In the world, Braden happens to be like the ultimate segue guy. I oh my love God. this. I promise it's not planned, people. I, I know it's not promise. planned. That's what I'm saying. This is so cool. <laughs> You're just like naturally leading on to these next steps, which is great. great. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go back over into our code. But by the way, I also thought, you know, first of all, there hasn't been very much discussion. In fact, I don't think there's been any discussion about what I'm wearing for today's episode. I don't uh, even do this for my own Twitch stream. <laughs> oh, you know, I it's so funny. When we started the time call to do tech setup, I made all, a huge deal about it. And then I totally forgot that <laughs> it, it just looks so natural on you, Michael, that I would assume this is like you wake up with a cowboy hat on your head. Yeah. Uh, so I just thought what would be nice to uh, add a little flavor here is I'm also going to go back in here and add this line here that's going to create an icon called icon hat and now inside of my uh you know inside of the initializing of this marker i can also add this line that says icon is going to equal my icon hat and uh you know that basically will allow and so icon hat you know it's just a png file you'll see this pop up when we do our next step but i'm gonna so i'm just saying you'll see why there's a visual change in a moment um but yeah yeah i thought i would add a hat to be a marker instead also shows that you can customize obviously your markers within the here maps okay so you know we've we've done all the event handling which is great uh the next thing that i'd like to do is i want to add a little helper function and this goes into exactly what was uh, stated by Braden. This helper function, what it does is it takes a, a geolocation point and it's going to convert it to a very friendly way of seeing those coordinates. You know, the raw would just be the, the number, you know, comma, the other number. But what we're doing is because, because geolocation coordinates are either positive or negative, uh, sometimes people like to think of that as north, south, east, or west. So we're just going to show like the, the friendly English way of saying these coordinates. Uh, again, you could see from the top when we initialized it that we have 47.66, you know, and we have this negative. The 47.66 is a north number for our latitude, and this negative 122 is a west number for our longitude. And and so, you know, just keep that in mind that there's a friendly way to possibly see those coordinates. And that's what this little helper function does. Now that we have the helper function, in fact, I'm, I'm going to, because I'm going to use that helper function in a certain spot just for simplicity, I want to actually put this above the dragging events right here. Uh, just just from the perspective of it's kind of a dependency we're going to be using even though i know it would still technically work uh just for the way it looks i'm also going to add another function to the page and this function is going to be doing a lot so uh this function it's it's going to call on that helper object that we just uh talked about uh let me i just want to separate this one function up here and just kind of, yeah, kind of separate it out from the rest because these are just to handle the, the UI of the drag and drop. So I'm even going to collapse those because they're not really that important. But this function here uh, for the drag end, that's where, uh, you know, we have we have some 
interesting things that we can do inside of this line 69. This process marker is what I want to call here instead. So I'm, I'm getting rid of this line of code, and I'm instead going to say uh, process marker and put in the target, uh, which was passed in. And that target happens to be the instance of the marker that was passed, right? So, or the thing that we're dragging around. So target is that marker. So when we see marker here, that's this target is being passed into here. Uh, you'll notice I don't need to have the behavior enable in here because I'm taking care of that inside of the process marker. So I, I was kind of building up small stages to lead to this point. But inside process marker, you'll see the line right before it is, let's go to our platform and call one of our services. That service is ultimately going to be our reverse geocode, which means I want to see the latitude and the longitude, but I'm also interested in seeing metadata around that, you know, latitude and longitude. So uh, maybe what I'll do right now, because I think this would be probably easier to explain, is let's show what the behavior is, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit about the code because that might be uh, an easier way to explain what's going on with this reverse geo code. Uh, so going back over to the map, I'm going to refresh this map. And remember, what I'm doing is I'm adding some code that'll happen when we drag and drop this thing, specifically when we drop it. So when I drop it, let's say right here, uh, let me refresh the screen just in case it didn't take. Oh, yeah, that's right, because oh, I changed yeah. the icon. So I had a cached version. OK, now we're dealing with some real stuff. So uh, let's take this guy and put it over here. Now, what you can see is this visualization. So, Braden, I'm getting brand new coordinates. That's being so wherever I dropped this this icon, it's let me know at the top the the north and the west. Right. And then. I'm also being able to get very specific address information because I'm pass I'm asking in the code. So I'll go show you the code again. I'm saying in the code, uh, when we do this reverse geo code, so I'm going to give you the lat and the long of where the marker was dropped. Now, now when I get the results, I'm going to go to whatever the very first result was. I also did a console.log of this. So if we wanted to be nerdy and go back over to the uh, screen. If I hit F12, um, I, I'll see that there's an object here, and this is all the information that got returned from our reverse geolocation object, right? Oh. Of which, if I go down into address, you'll see one of them is called label, and label's kind of like the full package, right? It's like everything in one string. So that's what I put into that little info box was the label. But I could have been very specific to any one of these things. So that's incredible how much information you can get from from that service. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? That is crazy. In county. Yeah. There it is. So yeah, all of that information you can get and and you'll see how this also gets used a little bit later, but we also have related search services around there. So and, you know, I'm not doing that in this demo, but just to give you a heads up, if I wanted to know what was within a, a mile radius of that area and I specifically was interested in food, I could do that too. You know, I could, I could look in, you know, for a number of things, gas stations, uh, just you name it, you know, we, there's a way we could search for that. But for right now, we're just getting some default metadata just about where is this thing right now on the map. And it's going to give me the thing that's closest. I can tell you right? at the area surrounding the, a, the Amazon campus in downtown Seattle that like all the restaurants close at 5 p.m. because I used to live there. <laughs> <laughs> That's great metadata to know. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. That you can update the map with that free of charge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. So now, now that we have that working, uh, let's start talking about talking. <laughs> let's start adding a little bit more information here to make this uh, a unique experience. So I'm going to now introduce. Uh, what is necessary to do stuff with a poly. And so the first thing I'm going to do is go back into our, our index or our, our HTML file, and I'm just going to drag in uh, a script. 
just a moment. And this is the script for the JavaScript SDK for, for browsers. Now, with that there, I just want to go, well, no, I'll wait. I'll wait to do this. So there is something I want to show you on, on the web, but I'll wait till I get to a very specific point for that. Uh, the next thing that I want to do after I've added this uh, script, which is again to the Amazon SDK, I, I want to introduce some visuals on the screen. Uh, those visuals are going to go right here underneath our map. I call this div voice box. And I'm going to scroll up a little bit so you could see basically what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm giving, you know, this is my official credits to free icon, free, free icons PNG. So, you know, at free, con, free icons PNG, I have uh, decided to take three faces. And I'm going to utilize those three faces inside of a div tag. And they're basically going to be selections. Now, uh, based on what Braden did earlier, you can kind of tell what the titles of each one of these images are mapping to. You know, I've got a Wait, Matthew. <laughs> I see something here that <laughs> I'm a little nervous about. There's a name here. Oh, yeah, the terrifying one on line 23. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're going <laughs> here, huh? We're, we're, we're going with this one. Yeah, we're, we are. So uh, what we want to do is ultimately make this one of these. If you click on one of these faces, you're going to be able to essentially select a voice for the map and let the map do some talking. So th that's what it is. So I've added the visual elements to the page that I need. Uh, in, order, in order for us to see those uh, correctly, however, I'm going to need to also add a little bit of stuff to our style. Because remember, our map is taking up the entire page, right? So if I'm adding another HTML element underneath the div, where is it going to go? Especially mm. if I'm telling the map to take up 100% of the screen. Uh, do you have any guesses what I would need to do to make this work? I mean, if you don't, that's okay too. I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess if, absolute if positioning not. where it's gonna overlay on it no matter what. That is a really good guess. It's mm. a really good guess. It's close. It, it, in fact, uh, I would say when I first started into this, I would have probably guessed the same thing. Uh, the one that I'm gonna use, however, is fixed. The reason why is absolute positioning is absolute to an area on the screen. However, if I scroll, it stays in its relative position. But if it's mm. fixed, it will not scroll if the screen scrolls. Now, we do a lot of zooming in and zooming out and some scrolling on a map. We want this thing to be in a fixed location in the lower right-hand side of the screen at all times. So that's why that's there. You go. Um, the other thing that I'm going to do is those those images could be a little big, so I'm going to make sure that they are also styled to just be a width of 25. So for right now, we'll come back and we'll we'll explore some other ways we can make these uh, uh, styles a little interesting. But for right now, that'll give us the basics of the visuals of these particular faces. But they're going to mean nothing unless there's some code that's also added, right? Because right now, all, we're, all we would do is just see something on the screen, and that's it. We haven't done anything special. So I am going to go into the uh, poly.js file. This is one of those files that I already have finished. I didn't want to build this one out. I wanted to talk through it because I knew Braden was going to be doing a little bit of some talk on poly, so I thought I could just let you know what I did unique. The first thing on line four that I want to talk about, this init AWS is a custom function. It's a custom function that I've created. Uh, it's an asynchronous one that actually establishes the credentials for my environment to use the AWS SDK. It is grabbing from even a different file altogether. But I want to show on the screen. I'm going to go over to back over to the browser. And specifically, 
I want to uh, get, go to this screen, and I believe you guys have the link for this. I, I, it was one of the links that I gave you that you can send out to uh, people in the chat, and that is this uh, getting started with the Amazon SDK within browser script. So uh, one of the things that you will do ultimately, and I'm just going to highlight it in here uh, when I see it. Oh, here it is. Uh, maybe I'll just kind of zoom in a little bit. Whoops, way too much. I just want you to be able to read it. Uh, here it is. This this logic right here, this creating a region and establishing your own credentials, this is the thing that I'm not showing on the screen, but was done behind the scenes. But if you want to know how to do it, here's the step-by-step -step instructions. If you follow the step-by-step -step instructions for the link that was just posted, you will have Polly working in your browser. So it's it's pretty straightforward. I'm highlighting that because I did not want to reveal my credentials. <laughs> so that, that's why there's this uh, little helper function that just says, OK, go ahead and call it. And then the only thing I'm doing is I'm console.log the result. This is an abbreviated syntax uh, in the newer JavaScript that allows me to just say it's returning a string message. And so since it knows that, it's automatically putting it into the console log arguments on my behalf. So it's a really short shortcut version this voice config we were kind of seeing a visual of what Braden did earlier uh, and this is more of the now code looking config where i'm i'm specifying what i want my output to be sample rate the type and also i have initialized that matthew will be the first one that will do the speaking in this voice config file. This voice config file is actually a parameters argument when I create the poly signer object. The poly object is is created, you know, according to whatever the API version is. And then when you create a poly signer object, you pass in the poly object as long with your voice config. And then this line 14, I even though I don't have an audio tag on my HTML, I can create one uh, dynamically. And that's what I did on line 14. I'm saying, well, I just want the benefits of an audio tag without having to create an audio tag. So that's all that line 14 is. It's the voice, you know, that's that's going to be used, whatever voice it is. The speak functionality says, hey, uh, we're going to pass in speech and voice. If there is a voice that's there, then go ahead and, and change whatever the voice config uh, you know, so we have Matthew, but if we change it to some, uh, like to uh, AM's favorite Justin, then then it'll say, okay, then let's pass Justin in there instead. If that argument wasn't passed in, then nothing happens. It just, you know, stays the same. Uh, we make sure that the text is whatever speech has been brought in. And the poly signer object is where all the magic happens. It's saying, oh, go get the speech, synthesized speech URL. So using all the information that it has you know we'll we'll get a console.log if there's an error but if not set the source of our audio up here to that url and play it i mean pretty much it's that simple so the speak functionality is literally give me what you want to say and who is going to say it that's pretty much how it's going to get called so any any comments or questions so far Oh, I'm sorry. I muted the whole channel uh, ever since you said Justin. Uh, so I've been <laughs> for the past. Uh, yeah. I don't like just to be clear, so people know. Yeah. I'm not like hating on people named Justin. I am hating on the <laughs> voice that is called Justin uh, that is provided by Polly. <laughs> that is the voice of a little boy, and it's terrifying. It sounds like something out of a nightmare uh <laughs> i i'm not i'm not the guy who's mean to justin i'm not i promise you'll you'll hear <laughs> i i i have a uh i have a a sneaking suspicion suspicion we're gonna hear justin's voice here in just a little bit uh yes it's true we will be it does sound like chucky um, alex alex smasha sounds uh says that justin sounds like chucky uh, like before Chucky <laughs> reveals uh, himself to be 
the soul of uh, a mass murderer uh, and then starts talking in his normal like the the buddy dolls from the Chucky movie, the, the original child's play, not the not the remake. Uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, on that note, <laughs> I, I would say from it, it, at least with with this poly JS file, I'll, I'll put it this way. Uh, you are in control if you ever do this am you could choose your own voice ids with whatever you want and that's that's a nice thing um back in the app js file uh because i'm going to want to use the functionality from poly i am going to at the very top of this screen uh there we go Again, I wouldn't have to do it this way, but I'm just saying I want to import the functionality from that poly file, specifically the speak function and the voice. I want to use those two things. Um, where am I going to use them? Well, first, the first thing that I want to do is right down here below, I, I am going to create something. And I know this seems like a little redundant, but just follow me along here where it says, we're going to let the current voice equal Matthew. And the reason why I'm doing that is, yeah, we already designated that in voice config, but I want to have this variable outside uh, in global space so that we can keep track of who's the current voice. So I just thought, well, I'll just go ahead and initialize it to Matthew again anyway. So by default, it will be Matthew. Now, what I'm doing on line 92 is I'm saying, let's go to the div that we created on the page called voice box. That's the thing that has the three images inside of it. And if if it gets clicked, then eventually on line 94, you'll, you'll notice line 94, we want to get whatever that selected image was. Right. Uh, so whatever image that we selected inside the div is what's going to come back from this event target. Uh, line 93 is basically removing a class called current voice. Uh, you know, we don't have one even designated on any of these at this time, except for, I take that back. Let me go back to this page. I believe we do. Yeah, you see where it says class equals current voice on uh, at the end of line 23? Does that show on the screen? Uh, do you see it right here? Uh, there it is. Yes. yes. Yeah. So. That means obviously I should probably have something up here that indicates what that means. You know, I, if, if I'm going to introduce some kind of a CSS style, I might as well, you know, say what does that mean. So I'm going to add to the the our styles up here something called dot current voice, and what that's going to do is it's it's going to introduce. Uh, it, it's kind of cool. It's it's going to make it so that the uh, whoever the current voice is will be able to see a lightening of their face. So th their face will be highlighted differently than the rest of them. So at least we know who the current voice is just by looking uh, visually at it. So I think that's a lot of stuff that's added. Let me go back to the app.js uh, and make sure I have everything that I need in here, because if we do, then I think it's time to to start seeing some of these changes and see if we can get Polly to work because it's it's been a lot of discussion so far, but not a lot of excitement with regard to the voice. Uh, so, Michael, after uh, joining Here Technologies, have your C has your CSS skills just like gone through the roof? No, actually, I would say it's not as good as when I was at previous places because I was using it even more. Really? Uh, wow. I think I'm getting rusty on my CSS skills, actually. Uh, but uh, yeah, I do. I think CSS is phenomenal. I it's it's one of my favorite texts. Okay, um, I think I have everything to let's let's see how everything looks in the map right now. So I'm going to go back over here and go back here and refresh the screen. Um, so you could probably see in the lower right. Do you see the um, the three faces? We do. You do. So here's the big moment of truth. Let's see if we actually hear a voice if we click on one. Hi, 
My name is Matthew. Let's try this one. Hi, my name is Joanna. And do you see how Joanna's face now is different than the others? Okay, you might want to plug your ears, AM. <laughs> Hi, my name is Justin. Oh, and I'm your friend till the end. <laughs> so we we've introduced at least these, but but that I mean, what's the point of having a map where you just have three faces at the bottom that say hi, whatever their names are? <laughs> it it it'd be more interesting is if I drag this hat around somewhere, um, instead of getting that visual data, maybe I could just hear about it, right? So that's what we're going to do next. We're going to we want to see uh, or no, we want to hear what happens when we drag and drop this somewhere and get some interesting information. OK, so let me go back over to our code. And, oh, and uh, you're going to need to delete please. that part where it says Justin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know what you know what might be kind of fun i tell you what uh i there was a voice that was played earlier kevin. by Braden, and i don't know was it kevin it was kevin, kevin let me yeah. let me just put that in there i'll put kevin here in the title and i'll change this image to image kevin uh because I respect the your nerves and you know how how traumatic things can be when you hear a voice oh, no. that scares you. Kevin is another so child I'll, voice, which is kind of creepy. Uh, <laughs> is it? Yeah. 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 I think it is. Yeah. We'll see how it sounds when we uh when we get back into it. But what I want to do is I want to go back to the uh process uh the process marker. Because remember, it's when we are at the end of dragging and dropping something that we can introduce some behaviors. And right now, what we're doing is we're showing this bubble of information. What, what I want to do is actually uh, not use the bubble information anymore. I mean, uh, and the reason why I'm saying that, we could keep it on, but every time I drag the marker because of the info bubble, I now have to close that info bubble before I can drag it again. And so it's always, you know, frustrating. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, comment out those lines of code. So now what can I do? Well, I'm going to create another object up here. That object is going to be let speech uh, equal so far nothing. So, but I'm going to create it as an empty string. Uh, I technically do not need my message anymore because we're not going to be displaying anything in the info bubble. <clears throat> Pardon me. And uh, now uh, I'm going to add two lines of code because I don't want to type them, but I, I'll explain them right here. So I'm saying, okay, inside here, let's let speech equal whatever district you might be in. If you don't have a district, then don't put one. Whatever city you're in, if you don't have one, okay, put nothing. And then whatever state you're in. So that that's basically what I'm saying is give me the combination of those things. Your district, city, and state. You know, uh, districts can be like even a downtown area could be a district, right? Downtown Seattle in Seattle, Washington, you know, that would be a district. Uh, and, and if there's areas or districts you're aware of in your neck of the woods, maybe we'll give it a try. But that that's essentially what we we want to call this speech while we after we drag and drop uh, our marker. So do you want to see if that works? Yeah, I mean, there are going to be some places that I, I want you to go and see <laughs> okay. what, what they say. Uh, OK. I literally just Googled latitude and longitude of Area 51, and I'm pretty sure I'm on a government list now. <laughs> uh, I've got it. If you need it, I would love to hear what Area 51 says. What that district is, is Area that 51? Is um, so I just reloaded the page. We'll know if everything is working correctly is if I drag and drop that marker somewhere and hear something about that place. So Lorton Park, Seattle, Washington. Okay. Nice. 
So now look at this. Uh oh, Kevin. Uh oh. You're Kevin. Hi, my name is Joanna. Kevin is not working. Kevin's on vacation. Oh. Kevin. Kevin got left at home while his uh, family went to, to his family went to Kevin, New York, France. I'll have to check and see why Kevin didn't work as a voice ID. Uh, it could be the you'll notice when you get into poly that some of the voices have some restrictions on them. And there could be some kind of restriction on Kevin that I wasn't aware of. So uh, unfortunately for you, AM, eventually when I go back to code, I'm going to have to change that back to Justin. Uh, but let's let's have jo Hi, my name is Joanna. I'll, like I'll Joanna. move this across over here. Maple Leaf, Seattle, Washington. So we could see. And now if I span, you know, you know, expand out. Yeah. Um, I know there's some pretty interesting places around. Snohomish. That's 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 pretty close by. Where what's it called? Snohomish or Sahamish is over there to the right. That's that's an interesting one. Sammamish, Washington. Oh, wow. oh yeah. right. Yeah, a lot of in that's good. indigenous peoples, uh, you know, names in this area because there are a lot of indigenous peoples in in this area. Now, there's a lot of places that are just just barren of a city or anything like that. So if I go to some place, I could I, randomly Arizona. select a city, Arizona. But if I have nothing, it just returns the state. Yeah, you see, that's why I had that combination built because it's like, okay, no city, no district. Well, at least give me the state, right? And check this out. Guacho Chihuahua. <laughs> wow. Lilithicus Zacatecas. <laughs> so I mean, it's even Pretty working. Yeah. New Mexico. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go back over to the code. And we're going to have to make a few changes, uh, one of which uh, we got to bring Justin back in. So I did uh, look Kevin up, for some um, reason. Michael, I was able to look in and and Kevin, it, you're right. It, he is not enabled for the standard engine of poly, but he is enabled for the neural engine uh, of poly, right? So, uh, yeah, you were right on the spot there. See. Yeah, I, that's I'm too also, bad. I, until you you tell me otherwise, Michael, I, I'm writing a narrative in my head where anytime <laughs> that you click on an area and it just gives you the state, that means the government redacted what was in that region. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Good. That's so funny. Um, what else did I, oh, I know what I wanted to do. I wanted to also say, okay, with that change that we added, I also think it's probably a good point to also change a little bit of the styling again. Uh, just because I want to see, like, when when they're actually speaking, I would like to add an effect that when there's whoever's speaking, I can see them speaking. So I'm I'm going to oh. add this new style on here um, called speaking, and what that's going to do is it's basically I call this style flame around your head. You know, you will have a flame ignite around your head that will indicate that you're the one who is currently speaking. And, you know, so, it, you know, just just by logic, let's just talk this through. Okay. When would we want to see that start and when would we want to see that end? Mm. I know that sounds like a simple question, but but just talk it through. When would we see the flame appear? When would it, it would, appear and when would it disappear? Have to be after drag end for it to appear. You're right. Well, we know at the drag end is when something starts. What starts? Right. The audio, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess what I'm trying to get at is that we don't know how long it's going to take for this person to talk. So I can't just put a timer on there. What right. if I put some location that's so long, you know, it just rattles on and on and on, you know? Or what if it's a really small location, simple? So I guess what I'm trying to say is, what we want to do is we want to add code that will automatically trigger at the beginning of the audio and at the end of that audio. Uh, so that's really where I was going with that. Let's, let, let's, let's just tie in that code. So in order to do that, um, I already have some event listeners that I'm just going to bring into the mix. And I'm going to put that at the end of our, our app.js file right here. 
And basically we're saying, hey, the voice, remember the voice is that audio tag that I created that doesn't technically exist in the HTML, it's just a dynamic audio. And hey, the voice, when you begin to play, let's toggle the current voice to have a speaking class. And then when it's ended, take the speaking class off of that image. So we're dynamically starting the begin of when it shows and when it ends. Uh, so that, that adds a little bit more fun interactiveness. Plus, another thing that I thought would be nice is in addition to the fact that we're gonna add all of that speaking capability, it might also be nice to give the voice box itself a little bit more um, substance. So what I mean by that is this, this class here, I'm just gonna add a little bit more or this uh, ID, and it's just gonna add a little bit more background information. So we could see those faces on, on like, a, like a little rounded uh, panel, I guess, a, for lack of better words. Something interesting, uh, Quick Like Turtle came uh, up with uh, an, a kind of a use case to work through that I think maybe if we all three put our heads together, we could we could talk through how to make this work. So, uh, you know, when jo Joanna was pronouncing some of those uh, areas in Mexico, she didn't have the greatest accent uh, or, or the greatest pronunciation, but there are voices that, that do, uh, you know, for that language. Is there a way to, is there any sort of data coming back from here about the country to ascertain yes. what language uh, that they speak and then to pick a, a voice based <laughs> off of that? So yes and no. So okay. so what's what's good is it's not really going to give you the language per se. The although country. I believe I believe there is a base layer that you can request. So at the, at the uh, beginning when we were initializing the map, we just went with what we call like default base information behavior. But I think one of them might be actually um, maybe some of the common speaking languages in that area, because as you know, every area could have multiple languages spoken. Uh, but for the most part, like when you think of international uh, codes that are like um, US-EN for US-based English and stuff, if you had a small metadata table that you could just do a quick mapping of your country code to one of these, uh, then you could then also in that same mapping code for each one of those international ones that you support have the voice ID that would be the appropriate choice for that particular area. Uh, so, so uh, there's the answer to that. I mean, yeah, the poly voices do have that. Uh, there, there's there's like British, you know, mm -hmm. English and and uh, you know, so it's E N G B or or whatever. But yeah, the, po exactly. the poly voices have that lookup that you can do. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's all you really would have to do. It's it's just a simple cross, you know, it's just a check of this is where you're at, which code does it go to, which voice is used for that. And so you you would be able to set that up easy enough. Cool. Um, let me take a look now, because I think this is like the grand finale. Uh, all right. I, I have all the all the styles in there. We have everything pretty much done. I'm gonna do a refresh of this page. And uh, now you could see in that uh, lower right hand section, I don't know where my map went. Let's see. There we go. So let's let's uh, let me just make sure and test one of these voices to make sure it works OK. Hi, my name is Justin. Excellent. <laughs> just had to make sure. Um, now, now the idea is uh, moving this around once again. Uh, no, we get the same thing. Seattle, Washington. But when I move this icon again, I want you to look at the lower right hand side of the screen. Look and see which one starts to flame up and then I'll have AM give the answer. <laughs> Whoops. Let me try that again. I'll listen closely here. I, oh. I think actually some murderer did take over. <laughs> My name is Joanna. So let me move this over again. <laughs> Anywich, Seattle, Washington. <laughs> oh, thank you, Joanna. Anywich, Seattle, Washington. But you can see the little flame around the head. Even when you click on the voice, you Hi, can see the my name is Matthew. flame. Yeah. So you get the little things. So you know what, guys? That's pretty much the entire 
demo. Uh, I just wanted to sh show how you could build this map, make it interactive, and then just with a little tiny amount of stuff, I don't think it takes too much to integrate Poly. And there are so many possibilities. I have a feeling that a lot of people watching this would have way better ideas for how to use this even with the map than what I did. Uh, so hopefully uh, it gets everybody a little creative. Yeah, I mean, so for for any of you who missed the beginning of this, I had, uh, I mean, not to pat myself on the back too much, <laughs> but I had a great startup idea. And we just need David Duchovny and Jillian Anderson on board. That's it. It's not it's not hard. It just costs money, right? Uh, yeah. But Braden and Michael both have not decided to fund it. Uh, yeah, true. <laughs> but yes, I want to uh, I want to create a an, a map that will uh, you know take you through on the map to the various locations throughout the seasons of X Files, uh, which I've just started watching for the first time. Totally uh, striking while the iron is hot, right? Like this hot new show X Files, <laughs> like thirty years old now or whatever. Uh, yeah, you know, you could you could make a map where it just takes you across the United States uh, and beyond. I, I've only gotten through season one, and then all the descriptions of the areas and and the field notes are are you know Duchovny or Anderson's voice being read through Polly. I mean, it just sells itself basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You know what? It's funny when when I support people at hackathons and they come up with some ideas. Some some of the ideas, I would be like, I don't know, but there's got to be a vertical market for that out there. And sure enough, even if I feel like I don't know if I can relate, someone out there cares. I think you have legacy X file people out there, or or even newbies to X files. Like you said, it was over 30 years ago that that show <laughs> debuted. And uh, uh, maybe that's what's in now, you know, is, yeah. is to go back decades and, and, and discover what science fiction looked like over 30 years ago. I actually think you could like expand this to like a brand, a branded interaction with a series or a television show. Right. It, it, you can make it generic enough to where I could just slot in my my show. <laughs> like there's a there's another show where they go all across the United States called supernatural and they investigate all this stuff right uh it's more of a, a cw show uh it, it, which... am it looks like someone even said shut up and take my money yeah, i mean that's all so yeah it, first investors it's all there man. there you go it's good yeah yeah i actually do use um i use a service called atlas obscura i don't know if either of you are familiar with this um, you probably aren't because you're normal functioning human beings, uh, <laughs> unlike me, uh, who's just kind of a weird dude. Uh, not to say anybody who uses Atlas Obscure is weird, but it is kind of a, a stranger side of road tripping. So it's like you go, if you go look it up, it's it's uh, basically a bunch of uh, off the beaten path or strange attractions in all of these different cities. You could totally make a map with like uh, you know a little narration around uh, some of these these stranger things. Like for example, my wife and I. I'm on a total tangent now. I hope you two are buckled in and ready. Uh, <laughs> my wife and I went to London a, a few years ago, and and I used this site, and we went to this. Uh, it was one of the first operating theaters, uh, like surgical operating theaters. It was a museum now. Uh, but I'd never heard of it and would have never heard of it without this site. And it was so cool. I mean, it's very macabre, obviously, uh, because it's like old medicine, you know, so it's like it's all kinds of strange things that they used to do uh, that they called medicine. Uh, but it was one of the first ever operating theaters where you could go watch surgery taking place. Um, wow. Whoa. Yeah. It was cool, uh, and and this site. So I mean, this they could totally, totally benefit from having a uh, an interactive map like this, telling me about each of these sites, right? So go close that deal, Michael. I just set that up for you, teed it up. That was <laughs> true. If you're watching, get at Palermo Four. <laughs> That's funny. Anyway.
uh Braden, what what after seeing this what do you want to do with it yeah there's there's so many things i was i was just you know thinking about this um my family's really into family history so uh my grandparents are from the philippines on both sides and i know that i love to be able to hear the stories about their childhood and where they grew up and what their house was like i think for me it'd be really awesome to record those stories and have them pointed out on a map for my future kids or generations to be able to click on that that you know interest points and have it read out well this is where you know the, your great great grandmother uh, started fishing or something like that I I think that's in itself would be a really cool way to be able to implement it in our family yeah Justin can read those stories to your children yeah yeah exactly Justin forever <laughs> <laughs> I'll be sure I'll be sure to always have it played at nighttime just for the extra effect too. AM. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm a big Justin fan right there. Um I think what would be fun, I don't know, uh we've got about 15 minutes left. Um we don't have to do this, but uh I take it as an exercise for all of you uh that they go and maybe build with us. Uh, take it to whatever area you're in. Um, I don't know if this is just a Texas thing, but there are like eight different ways to pronounce a city or street or whatever. And uh, these things never get it right, according to the local. Uh, <laughs> like there's a road out here. Uh, it's also a city uh, out here in Texas near where Braden and I are called. Uh, it's spelled B U R. I knew it. E-T. I knew you were going to mention that one. <laughs> E-U-R-N-E-T. How would you think that is pronounced, Michael? Well, I don't know, but I am going to see what if we can find it on the map somewhere. So I'm going to at least bring this guy into the Texas area. Texas. Okay, thank you. Uh, and now, do I follow 35 again? or? Let's see. It's probably north uh west of austin is that right Brady? yes let's see northwest austin how let's far see. northwest is it on the screen or it's pretty small see did you spell it out again for him uh am b-u-r-n-e-t There's Taylor, Texas. Can you tell me to go up or down? Yeah, here we go. Up, isn't it? Yeah, so it's northwest. So if you, uh, so I'm looking, I'm comparing here. So you see Leander there. So if you go mm-hmm. a little bit to the left, if you're following, you probably have to zoom in a little bit. Yeah, it's too small. I think you have to zoom yeah, in. It, it might be too small, to be honest. It's a pretty small town. Oh, it, it'll be on here. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, if you, you zoom in a little bit, you're going to find this highway, Highway 29, that's going uh, east to west, right above Lee. Uh, let's see where, where we're at here. So there's Leander. Leander is right here. How does it yeah. say Leander? So Leander is going to, you're just going to go west of that and a tad north in, in order from Leander in order to be able to see it. I got to find my hat again, bring it down. There you go. Okay. Texas. <laughs> nice texas um <laughs> government re- okay. redacted let's let's get okay. closer to like leander all right leander, so now you're gonna go texas. west of there and just a tad north and we're just gonna keep zooming in until we find something it's it texas. Leander. there you go get pretty close texas what do you think uh more north? Yeah, I think it's going to be a little bit Liberty more north. Hill, Texas. Oh, Where's there's Liberty, Liberty Hill. Liberty Hill, okay. All right, we're out. So if we just keep going west, uh, I think you might hit okay. it. Oh, this, Texas. This is... Yep, we'll keep going. Texas. <laughs> I love that it says Texas. Everything's Texas, I think. Liberty Hill, Texas. So oh, still wow. Liberty Hill. Uh, so do you see Highway 29 on there? So I'm having a little bit hard time seeing with uh, with my screen. I know Ranch the colors Road, on mine. 1869. 
You see that Ranch Road 1869? Let me switch over to satellite view. There you go. And uh, let's see. See what I'm saying? There's this Ranch Road, Country Road. Yeah, I no, see that. So you're on, yeah, you're on that ranch road there. So if you're going to go a little bit more north uh, until you hit uh, Bertram. Oh, there's 29. Hit. I see 29. Yeah, so yeah, follow 29, and you should see uh, at some point that that town. Hey, there's Bertram from yep. Texas. There's Bertram. Bertram, Bertram. Bertram so you're just so, going to keep following 29 west, west. and then yeah. you're going to eventually hit that. Okay. Uh, how far? Uh, not very far. So I'd say, is it this one miles? right here? Yep, there you that's go, it right here. there. That's it. Okay, let's find out. Burnett, Texas. Wrong. Oh, wrong. <laughs> what a it's failure! Wrong. <laughs> it's wrong. It's wrong. Uh, that's it. so. How do you say Burnet? Burn Burnett. Burn it. Burn it. <laughs> oh, well, you know what? We have one of those in, in Arizona as well. This one I can find pretty easy. I'm sure it's not going to say it correctly. Burn Are it. you ready? There's a, there's a town here in Arizona that is called a certain thing. And most people don't get it right. <laughs> so let's uh, Arizona. wander over here and... Uh, here it is, right there. Prescott, Arizona. Oh, I got it wrong. It's Prescott. 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 There you go. Prescott. Wow. You don't say Prescott. It's Prescott. Prescott. Oh, wow. <laughs> regional regional dialects are uh, yeah. very... So to be fair for everyone listening, uh, Amazon Poly actually allows you to be able to configure those pronunciations. You can upload yes. those pronunciations. So I'll say stuff like Prescott. <laughs> Look at that, Braden. Right back on track for that right there. I love it. Yes, you can <laughs> You can actually correct Poly. Uh, that's interesting. Hmm. Earn it. Cool. Yeah, that's how you, you could, like, there's a bunch of streets... I grew up in Houston, which Houston has one of the weirdest uh, accents, by the way. Like, it, it's not a Texas accent. It's 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 just like this weird regional non dial I don't know. Anyway, but there's like eight different streets that everybody's like, oh, well, you're not from Houston if you say it this way. Um, <laughs> and all of the GPS, they all get it wrong. Like, anytime you put it into any type of map. Uh, Anyway, that was that was a fun tangent. <laughs> so we should probably wrap up. Um, I'll, I'll I'll pull us back on the rails here. I'm gonna switch us back to our uh, this is our view. This is who we are. Uh, if you've been watching or you tuned in later, you've been watching AWS Howdy Partner. We do this show every Monday and Wednesday, typically from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Pacific, uh, or some allotment, but always starting at 2 p.m. Pacific. Uh, we got Michael Palermo here from uh, here, Tech, uh, and he showed us how to drop in a map with uh, an insane amount of features. I mean, just just like less than 10 lines of code, and you had a bunch of features already working in the map. And then it was pretty trivial to get that marker, uh, you know, sliding around and Pretty trivial to read off that, you know, description tag or, or district tag or all those other, other different tags and send it to Polly and have now a map that talks to you. I mean, you didn't really have like when I think about, you know, 15 years ago, what that would have taken to uh, actually mm -hmm. achieve uh, that would have Good been point. like. I, I don't know, multiple development teams getting paid a lot of money um, and. Now you can just do it in an afternoon. So it's pretty amazing. Uh, Michael gave us a bunch of links. Um, I will pull those up. Uh, we've got uh, our docs links, uh, our docs and links. You can go sign up for a here account for free, right, Michael? Yep. Totally free. No credit card or anything. Just go sign up. Um, 
another way. So Michael gave us a great way to get started with Polly with his code. Another easy way to get started with it is one of my favorite things. I have to say it, and I, I feel like every stream that I do, AWS Amplify, uh, I swear they don't pay me. Uh, <laughs> I promise. Uh, but I love it. It's it's a super easy way to get started building a front-end application, either mobile or web app, uh, in whatever flavor of JavaScript, React, um, Angular, etc. And could I've here, done this whole thing. Could I have absolutely. done this whole thing with Amplify? Yes. Oh man, yes. I should have done that. It would have been uh. super easy too. Uh, so uh, I'm glad that you showed us the vanilla way to do it. Like the the I just want to touch JavaScript. I don't want to work with the framework. I think that's it's uh, definitely. We actually had a question earlier from uh, Poyas Hernandez about uh, TypeScript. Are there any TypeScript bindings for uh, the here SDK? Um, uh, no. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, not not any that are like uh, uh, published. I bet you there's some open source stuff out there, but uh, yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, Michael, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it to you um, before we close out. Is there anything else you'd like? I know you have a conference coming up. You want to plug that, uh, but anything yeah. else too? Yeah, so obviously, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, inviting me to Howdy Partner, give me an excuse to wear my hat. It was great. Uh, there is a conference this week that we are engaged with. It's really exciting. It's uh, We do this annually, but this is the first time, of course, we've done it virtually. It's called Here Directions. It's one of the links that I did provide, and uh, uh, you could register for free. Uh, it's this week, September 16th and 17th, and there is a developer track, and uh, I'll be uh, doing one of those sessions, although I will not say what it's on. I'll just say... Uh, Check out the developer track. <laughs> a band of mystery. Uh, so you have to sign up if you want to know what Michael's going to talk about. I think yeah. that's that's a, a nice little incentive. Brayden, anything from you? What I mean, uh, we've got a uh, we've got another episode of Howdy Partner coming up this Wednesday. I don't. I can give the details if you don't have them. Yeah, I, I don't happen to have those details, but yes, we do have another uh, show coming up this Wednesday at uh, same time, 2 p.m. Pacific time, and uh, join us again for, for another episode with a different partner. Dynatrace. It's with Dynatrace. Dynatrace. There we go. So see Dynatrace uh, and learn about observability. Uh, so once you build your app that uses uh, here, you know, have have some observability <laughs> sent out to to monitor the API calls going out to here so you can know what's going on inside your application. Uh, but yeah, be sure to tune in. We will be uh, uh, back Wednesday. If you missed today's episode, it will be a video on demand here on the channel very soon. Uh, and you can watch it that way as well. But we always sign off in three different ways. We, we let the guests choose. Uh, do you remember the three ways, Braden? Yeah, let's see. I think uh, giddy up. Y'all come back now. And uh, happy trails. Is that is that got the other all. one? Got them all. Not at all. Yeah. Did I miss all of them? No, you got all of them. Oh, I got all of them. I was like, oh yes. goodness. Okay. No. Oh. So Michael, you get to pick. Y'all come back now. You hear? Happy trails or giddy up? Which which would you like to sign off? Giddy up. Oh, there it is. All right. Okay. Go. All right. On three, we will giddy up on out of here. Thank you for watching. Be sure to tune in next time. One, two. Three. Get it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>